Hey, True Crime Besties, we're back for part two of three of episode 10, Unsolved Murder, Stacey Colbert and the Hunt for the Monster in a Mask. I'm Jules. And I'm Joe. And let's go. If you have not listened to part one of episode 10, please go back and do so. You will not want to miss part one. Now, this is a three-part series. Next week, we will have the final and third part of episode 10. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you are listening. And please tell your friends to give us a chance. (laughs) We're desperate. (laughs) We'd love to continue to build our true crime and headlines community. You guys are amazing. And we are so thankful you trust us with your time and you trust us to dive into stories that we feel need to be heard. Josephina, are you here? I'm ready. (laughs) Are you ready to go? Let's do it. All right, let's keep this going for Stacy. Time to dive back into finishing Stacy's fight. We left you in Columbus, Ohio in 1998 when 23-year-old Stacy Colbert was missing from her apartment. Her sister, Danielle, called the police after Stacy's work AEP told her that Stacy had not shown up to work in two days. We dove into what was at the scene and what wasn't. You know, Joe, recall how it smelled like bleach? Yeah. And and how this monster had over 48 hours to clean that apartment top to bottom. I'm so curious if he went back. Me too. That takes some guts. If he ever left? Yeah. There's a lot of unknowns here, and any DNA evidence that could have been salvaged had somebody, <clears throat> the neighbor, called the cops immediately when they heard the loud screams, the thumps at 4 a.m., possibly they could have salvaged some DNA or interrupted something, don't you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it didn't happen, and so we have to work with what did Happen. You know, the neighbor did go and knock on her door the next day, Sunday at 2 p.m., and the door was ajar a little bit. And remember that Stacy's kitten, Boots, was walking around, but still did not call 911. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of the thought process there. Like, I hear this chick screaming at all hours of the night, and her door's open at 2 30 in the afternoon. She's not answering, and her cat's outside. All is well here. Moving I think on. I'll go to Subway. Hey, what? <laughs> Why'd you even check then? And Blockbuster. I just tried to pick the most 90s <laughs> places I could think of. So now we know that the police did dust for fingerprints. And I know this because friends and family that were actually in Stacy's apartment did tell me directly that there was layers of dust in the apartment from dusting for fingerprints. And we also know that a large section of that carpet was taken. But, Joe, what about actual DNA evidence? Do we know what they actually have? Well, the police are not able to confirm what type of evidence, if any, that they have. Now, I did ask them. (laughs) They were so gracious to talk to me on the phone. And I did ask them. And and they cannot tell me. And I knew they couldn't tell me. But I also knew I got to shoot my shot. (laughs) (laughs) Which, if you know me, never really goes. <laughs> Julie will always shoot her shot. <laughs> Are those your skis? <laughs> Both of them. <laughs> so I, she has I, no social anxiety. <laughs> Zero. I just talk really fast and fill the silence and they'll laugh. <laughs> no, <laughs> they're laughing at me, aren't they? I just had a yeah. life revelation. <laughs> so again, the police are not able to confirm what type of evidence. But I did find this article that I will share with you, which, if the reporting is done correctly, it tells us that the police do, in fact, have DNA evidence, which they believe is the perpetrators responsible for attacking Stacy. On July 17th, 1998, the Marion Star newspaper from Marion, Ohio, publishes an article by Scott E. Gerfin. This article is titled, Police Seek Connections in Murder-Rape Cases, Looking for DNA Matches with Marion Felon. 
Marion, Columbus police are checking to see if there is a connection between a Marion rapist and several unsolved murder rape cases in central Ohio. Alvin Graham, 31, pleaded guilty last week to charges of rape, attempted rape, and aggravated burglary involving two local women. A judge sentenced him to 18 years in prison. One of his victims, a 22-year-old woman, told police Graham talked about a missing sorority girl while he raped her. Huh. Marion County Prosecutor Jim Slagle said during sentencing, he made a comment, you know that missing sorority girl in Columbus? She's not so missing, Slagle said. Stacy Beth Colbert, a 23-year-old Ohio State University graduate and member of Alpha Delta Pi, was last seen March 21 at her apartment on the northwest side of Columbus. She was reported missing three days later and has not been found. Columbus homicide detectives want to compare Graham's DNA with evidence collected from Colbert's case and others. Quote, there are certain things he has done and he's piqued our interest, end quote, said Detective Pat Barr. He has ties to certain areas of town here. We do have some unsolved cases that happened close to his friends or family. And it goes on to talk about how Graham did plead guilty to the charges, but maintains that the sexual contact was consensual. This article was published the same year Stacy went missing in 1998, just a few months later. And recall the incident I shared how one of Stacy's sorority sisters, Julie, was working with a news station after she was told in passing by Columbus cop that Stacy wasn't right, missing. wasn't coming home anymore. And they needed the public to still believe he that didn't she say was. she wasn't missing. She said she, he said she wasn't coming home. Yes. Okay. Correct. But we need the public to still be looking, looking for, for her. her. Right. Correct. And I'm curious, Joe, if maybe this is why. Maybe this article is why they said that I'm wondering if behind closed door conversations in that police department, you know, amongst themselves, was that Stacy was a victim of this serial killer. And for whatever reason, they wanted to have this killer believe they didn't connect him to it yet. Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that angle. And the article clearly states that DNA was collected from Stacy's apartment, you know, insinuating that it's not Stacy's. So I'm assuming, given that all the DNA that they got from the scene, that they concluded it was not this Graham guy? That is what I am led to believe as well. And if you're not familiar with CODIS, have you heard of CODIS, Joe? No. So CODIS, and I'll break it down really quickly for everyone who also is unaware. It's a police system used nationally to help identify unknown samples of DNA. Okay, you may have heard the term, run it through CODIS. So the Bureau of Justice Statistics explains that CODIS is, quote, an acronym for Combined DNA Index System, which is a computer software program that operates local, state, and national databases of DNA profiles from convicted offenders, unsolved crime scene evidence, and missing persons. Okay, so it's only as good as the DNA that's entered, obviously. And if the DNA is not entered, we're not able to match it to anything. But it's an incredible tool and program that is out there to link departments nationally. Yeah, that's great. And CODIS is maintained and run by the federal bro. I always say that word. The federal bread. FBI. Of sourdough. <laughs> the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> and the National Commission in the Future of DNA Evidence Organization says that DNA is entered into CODIS. So this is when it does get entered into CODIS to give you an idea of how much DNA is in this system. Quote, upon conviction and sample analysis, perpetrators' DNA profiles are entered into the DNA database. Just as fingerprints found at a crime scene can be run through APHIS in search of a suspect or link to another crime scene, DNA profiles from a crime scene can be entered into CODIS. Now, I know I'm throwing a lot of acronyms mm -hmm. at you, Joe, and this is how I feel when you talk about the mental health field. <laughs> <laughs> but APHIS is basically the fingerprinting system that we're all familiar with. You know, yeah. run their prints. Well, they're going to put it in the program. APHIS. And the official name for that is Automated Fingerprint Identification System. So do we know if the DNA from the scene was put into the system? No. 
It was not, or we don't know. I don't know. Okay. It is not a certain. I did I did ask that, and they did tell me that any evidence that was collected would have been tested. Okay. And it tells me, just connecting dots, that there was not a hit because there has not been any arrests. Okay. Now, I am led to believe a few things did happen here with Stacy's case. Let me run through three of them, okay? One, there was not enough DNA in the sample that was collected from Stacy's apartment off that carpet. Either it wasn't viable or it was contaminated, it was scrubbed and cleaned too well, or it wasn't enough to test for the technology at the time. Now, there were eyewitness reports who had seen the carpet where they had said that the carpet looked like the fibers had been scrubbed down. And this was before the carpet was taken for evidence. Yeah. I mean, it was 20 years ago. Yeah. 20 years ago. In terms of technology. And the perpetrator had an all-access pass to clean anything yeah. in the apartment. There are some theories that the blood was just a few drops from Stacy shaving her legs or cutting a fingernail. I, My gut tells me that's not true. I don't. It just, I don't know why. Do you feel weird about that one, too? Like, I feel weird about why? That is just her blood on the carpet that they collected a few drops came from shaving her legs. No, or, absolutely not. Not in this scene. <laughs> not when you have a shoe print on the back of the door. Like, bizarre. And, and handprints hand print. on the door, no, on the floor. No. Isn't that, no. Yeah, I just, I feel like they're trying to make a square peg fit in a round hole. Also, maybe they had collected the DNA, but they didn't have the results back in July when this article was released, and they weren't able to compare it to the DNA. And I also wonder if it really was ran through CODIS. I mean, I don't have a reason to doubt the Columbus Police Department, but I also know we always say I always say verify. You say trust no one. (laughs) I think if we operate as though in a cold case and we're under the the assumption that the first people didn't cross all their T's and dot all their I's, you're able to find something. And that's the beauty of fresh eyes. When people come behind and send us emails about things we got incorrect, they have a different perspective and fresh eyes. I know that the detective that was on this case for many years was compassionate and dedicated and wanted nothing more than to solve this case for Danielle's family, Stacy's sister. And he has since retired and it has now moved to a different cold case detective in the unit. And that is the one that I was able to talk with. Now, the former detective was emailing me and corresponding with me before, too. He was great to to talk with. But my experience so far with Delaware County has been great. And they did explain to me that they believe this case is solvable and they they have a suspect. Okay. And I don't know who it is. <laughs> they will not tell me. What are we Shock, waiting on? Shocker. You what don't want to tell Blabbermouth on? Podcaster your secrets? <laughs> Come on. Have a seat. <laughs> well, we'll go into what... I think they're waiting on. And, you know, it's possible. Okay, they did run it through CODIS and they got zero hits. And that just means that that person is not part of an unsolved case. Has not been caught yet. Exactly. And I want to know the last time the evidence was tested. There are so, like you said, Joe, so many advances since 98 in DNA testing now. And it's been over 20 years since the evidence was first collected. Who else have you killed, monster? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. (laughs) Oh, boy. So the killer that was mentioned in that article I just read was actually cleared after he was forced to take a lie detector test, and he passed. And he then goes on to claim that he only took credit for Stacy's disappearance as a scare tactic yeah. for the woman he was Yeah, I, I, that was my first thought when you said that, to get some kind of street cred in prison or to use it against that girl that, she was, that he was um, raping at that time. And recall Stacy's missing posters and flyers were everywhere. everywhere I'm exactly. sure. Exactly. Yeah. So it would not be hard to believe that this is true. And I am thankful that this lead was taken seriously and that that victim did come forward and replay and retell what yeah. she had heard because that's a lot of bravery. 
And is it possible that the police misled the press into thinking they had more DNA evidence from Stacy's apartment than they actually had? Absolutely. And would it be within their rights to mislead the press? Yeah. I actually think so. I mean, it's it's a tough one. I think you could argue both sides of that, Joe. But we know so many cases which involve communication with killers via the press. And it is a tactic used to scare the yeah. suspects. Yeah. But it did give many people hope that there was DNA evidence waiting to be tested. And Stacy's remains go on missing for 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. They continue to not have Stacy back. What are they mourning but being stuck in the unknown? She's not home. What kind of torment and turmoil will a family have to go through while they cannot find their loved one? We know that Kay Alana Turner's family is going through this that exact thing right now, and they're just begging for help from anybody. Mm-hmm. And I can't imagine years and years of this. Well, sadly, November 27th, 2004, six years later, a man out searching in a field for his hunting dog which is in a county just 30 minutes from Stacy's apartment, comes across what appears to be skeletal human remains. Now, this little blurb from an article I found is not a lot to digest, but it does say a few things. Now, it's from NBC4 News website on November 28, 2004, and it says, Women's skeletal remains found near Cornfield. Sheriff's office remains appear to be those of woman. An anthropologist and law enforcement officials spent Sunday dusting off bones and combing a wooded area where a woman's skeleton were discovered on Saturday afternoon. A hunter stumbled up on the remains near Radnor in the northern part of Delaware County, NBC4's Natalie Walston reported. The woman's age, race, and cause of death remain mysterious, Watson reported. The hunter was searching for a missing dog when he came across the skeleton. Can you imagine that? No. No. You know, I did think I... Okay, yes. <laughs> I thought I found a femur of a human in my creek bed. And I was like, this is it. I'm going to solve a crime. I'm going <laughs> to... And true crime was born. <laughs> I'm going to help bring a family to justice. I got to photograph it. And it was a cow. It's a cow bone. A, a cow femur versus a human femur? You know, I'm not great with my proportions and proportions. You should see me. The first time I cooked lasagna for John, oh, my gosh. If I've ever made you food, it means I really cared for you because it stresses me out. And I'm not good at it. So if I ever brought you anything, it's like, just know I loved you, okay? (laughs) I made eight pans of lasagna. Eight pans. I just wanted one little pan. I just – I don't understand. (laughs) Proportions. Proportions. I tried to dig through Joe and find out more information on the man who discovered Stacy's remains. And it's a bit convoluted, and here's why. The man named in a subsequent article is not the same name of the man that is reported by huh. other people to be connected to the case to have found her remains. Yeah, that made me do that, too. Why would this matter? Okay, here's why. One was recently convicted of sex crimes against minors huh. and is in jail. Okay. The other is not. <laughs> so they named him as two different people. Correct. They are two completely different individuals. I don't know which one actually found her. Actually found her. I did take one and run with it, the one that was convicted of crimes. Yeah. And tried to triangulate where he lived in relation to Stacy's apartment and to where Stacy's remains were found. And it's about a 30 minute radius. But again, around. you would think that he would be in that database. Yeah, you would think you'd be in the database, but also you would think that then the DNA from the alleged DNA from the scene would now be in that database. So it would have hit. Yeah. After samples, if there was DNA. If there was a match. Correct. If he's had any samples. Exactly. There's a lot of ifs. 
aside from that, and I'm not purposely giving out this man's name because I do not want to give misinformation since there's a discrepancy in this individual who discovered her remains. Uh, However, aside from whoever it was, was the story checking out? Did he have a hunting license? What was he hunting? Was he training his dog? Did he ever find the dog? What was the dog's name? <laughs> I They seem so minimal in the scheme of things, but I don't think they are. You have to go through every single lead. Otherwise, you yeah. still have these cold cases. When there's a cold case, you have to get petty. Yeah. It's funny. You think of those things, but I, that didn't even cross my mind when you said somebody happened upon her until you said, have we looked in, into him? I don't even kind of think of those angles on these cases. Whose land is it? Is it even legal to hunt there? I have a lot of questions as always, and this has been unsolved for 20 plus years. At this point, it's unknown if these remains are Stacy's, but in an article on December 1st, 2004, 10 TV WBNS in Columbus, Ohio reports. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Bones identified as Stacy Colbert's. Skeletal remains found over the weekend in Delaware County have been confirmed to be Stacy Colbert, a 23 year old Ohio State graduate who went missing in 1998. Colbert was not really on the radar in this case because the anthropologist said the skeleton belonged to a woman probably in her 40s. And Colbert was just 23. But Wednesday, a Columbus cold case homicide detective confirmed that the body is indeed that of Colbert. Colbert disappeared more than six years ago in March of 1998. She was last seen at her apartment near Kenny and Henderson. And it goes on to talk about how the sorority sisters passed out flyers. And it says this. Detectives withheld some evidence in the case to identify a killer if one was ever found. But 10TV did learn at the time that a piece of bloodstained carpet was removed from that apartment. And that is very interesting to me. And I am not surprised about withholding the evidence. That is a smart move to keep it between the police and the killer. Don't show all your cards. But I want to know. And no, we still don't know her cause of death. Now, I read that it was estimated that Stacy's remains were in that field for a minimum of two years. However, she was missing for six. So where was she? Now, there are some theories that Stacy was there the entire time. But that article also states that many workers were in that area within the last five years and did not discover any of her remains. So that is an argument that people are using to say that Stacy was relocated. Yeah, absolutely. And it was right by a cornfield. And so you would think that that farmer for years and years and years either had help or was somewhat near that area. Multiple times. Well, and you know, I live in cornfields, <laughs> and there's not a lot of people involved in in the actual day-to-day operations unless you're doing the active, you know, the tilling and the rotating the crops and the seeding and the harvesting. There's a lot of time that goes in between, and a lot of times it's done with these huge combines. Yeah, it is. But – not so much maybe in 2004, but back in the 90s, I mean, we would hand detassel. And so that was a job that many of my friends had. My mom wouldn't let me because I wasn't tall enough. <sighs> but you would go, you literally load up on buses and go out to the cornfields in the summer and you would detassel for the farmers. And that's going up and down every single row of corn um, and detasseling. So. Who knows what kind of technology they have. Here's what I'm wondering, though. When you're not actively looking for something, it may not stick out. I actually can believe that a man looking for his dog found her remains as he would be actively seeking out a sight line. Yeah, I agree. The ground. And, you know, there was a creek nearby. Some people speculate that Stacy's remains were taken there to dump her into the creek. And maybe the the creek was risen and she was taken down more. 
you know, it's 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 unknown. Just put that out there. We don't know. I read on a forum that the Facebook page Finishing Stacy's Fight posted. Somebody said, quote, the area where she was found is obscure and off the beaten path. I have lived directly south of that location for 20 plus years and have only found reason to drive through there once. It's just not an artery to anything unless you live nearby or go to school in that area. Whomever put her there, in my opinion, was familiar with that area, and that may be the key to this whole case. With today's technology, hopefully investigators have taken a second look at the people who were originally interviewed or suspected in her disappearance to see who had connections to a familiarity with that area, end quote. Yeah. Do we know anything about the farmer that owns that land? Or No. What I would like to know is who was working during those years where Stacy was missing and before, because I do believe it was someone familiar with that area before. And then I also want to connect it to people at Ohio State University and connect it to Stacy's inner circle. I would start with her inner circle and branch out. Who in her inner circle has a close connection to her? That's a male. Who has connections to anybody who has connections to this farmland? Was there a local that they were friends with? What about roommates? Were they locals there? Did they date someone local? We need to tie all of these loose ends together. I think that is a very That's wise, a good point. Yeah. December 2nd, 2004, the Marion Star article by Jillian Daly had an interesting part that I want to share with you guys. Colbert, who was five foot one inch tall, About the estimated height of the remains, Delaware County Sheriff Al Myers said that he doesn't know when the young woman was placed there beneath the trees, and forensics has yet to determine cause of death. He said there are a few leads. Quote, we still have a large amount of leaves and articles from the scene. End quote. Myers said at a press conference Wednesday, quote, hopefully there's a story in those leaves. End quote. Columbus Police Department homicide detective David Morris said some of the articles found in the one and a half bags of leaves and underbrush gathered could be used as evidence. But despite new evidence, it's a cold case. Quote, we have a strong reason to believe that the intruder was known to her. End quote. Morris said. Reports indicate an intruder took Colbert from her home in a Governor's Square apartment building, and then the article continues to explain what we've already laid out for you. That one line there is going to guide the rest of our podcast coverage. We have a strong reason to believe that the intruder was known to her, end quote. Okay. And here we go. This This is is when we (laughs) take them down. (laughs) If you're hearing this and you have any doubt about what you may wonder that you have or don't have, if it's anything, it's time to call the Delaware County Police Department, babe. 740-833-2810. Here's your sign. We talked in part one how we believed it was someone known to her because there were no signs of forced entry. She agreed to open the door willingly And it was after she had ordered the food. So she wasn't expecting a delivery. And we don't know if she was expecting anyone else. And here we find ourselves where we started. In 1998, at Stacy's apartment on that Friday night, after she chats with people at that Arlington bar, her colleagues, and some unknown individuals. And we still don't know who the man or men are that Stacy was chatting with at the bar. Yet we know she went home, we know she got a ride, and we know she opened her door for someone, and that was the last action of free will she was ever allowed to do. Because we need a fair trial, whether or not we believe a monster deserves a fair trial is obviously not up to us. If it was up to us, we would have have a really skewed judicial system. (laughs) You need to be punished. (laughs) Natural consequences. (laughs) We cannot give one suspect a fair trial and another in 
a trial in public opinion and wonder why the public gets it mixed up at times. And that's because humans are biased. We're driven by emotion and our views are clouded with grief, trauma, and purpose. However, it's those people who hold themselves in the fire, which are often the ones brave enough to jump up and down in the flames and they're shouting to the world, please listen to me. I know who did this. Those are the brave ones. Josephine Er. We could tell you the name if we chose to go against our investigative ethics, which will not happen. But what if we did? And what if that man was innocent? Yeah, I get that. We've taken another victim in another tragic case. So lots of people think it's lots of different people is what I'm getting. I will say 90% of the names were one name. To all of Stacy's warriors shouting from the flames, standing in the middle of the fire, burning to hear you to notice you, we want to help you have a voice. But we're also going to make sure we instill ethics in true crime reporting. Look at all the angles. So an article from NBC4 News says, quote, detectives say they want to talk to two men in connection with the disappearance of Stacy Colbert. Police will only say that the two men are close associates of Colbert's, have retained legal counsel, and refused polygraphs. Police suspect Colbert may have let one or both of them into her apartment on March 21st, the last day She was seen alive. How do they know this? A source close to the investigation says police have administered three polygraphs since Colbert's disappearance, all of which checked out okay. Wow. Police say two men who knew Stacy, close associates, may have gone to her home after she came home from Arlington, after she ordered breadsticks, and they denied a polygraph. They immediately lawyered up. This is going on at the same time as Stacy's friends and family are searching for her and clearing out her apartment. It's comfortable. <laughs> it sounds a little freaking me out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I told you we got to shake and rattle things up. I'm I'm really hoping that we can provide something out there for somebody to remember or spark or say, "Hey, there's some new hope in this case." Her friends and family are damned if they let this case go, quote unquote, cold. Oh, hell no. Not if it's my family. Hell no. This is True Crime and Headlines with Jules and Joe. I'm Jules. And I'm Joe. (laughs) And we hope you'll consider donating to the GoFundMe for Stacey's team's efforts in solving her murder. I would love to see a billboard go up, and I would especially love to see it go up in Columbus. Please help the team by donating. They're at $1,000, which is about... Only 10 hours of work oh, come on. with a private investigator, and they need more. Guess what? You're loved. You're wanted. <laughs> you deserve to be found. And that's my dog. We love you. Bye. And Lee. I'll see. My mama is a podcaster. Bye, too.